That was pretty much my whole talk right here. <laughs> so, language. So, uh, good morning, everybody. So, my name is. Stefan Jurgensen. These are my wife's two hilarious uh, niece and nephew. Just think my name is, is, is just funny. <laughs> I was born in a small town right below the North Pole, and this would be kind of of an average winter day. So we, as kids, we would jump out of the second uh, floor of our house down into the snow. So this is kind of my uh, uh, upbringing, comes from this. And then back 20 years ago, I moved to this. <laughs> and this was a city named Atlanta that I frankly had never heard of before. And uh, I'd been to New York and I'm like, well, Atlanta must be just like New York. And, uh, you know, 20 years ago, let me tell you, it was not. Uh, nowadays, you could argue that Atlanta is actually getting close to a, a, a big city. I'm actually pretty excited about what's going on in Atlanta now. So I've been here, as I said, half my life. So I'm now kind of in this in-between state. Uh, how, show of hands, how many uh, have English as a second language in the audience? So there's a couple. Uh, any Icelanders in the audience? No, nobody? No, no Icelanders? <laughs> What's up with that? So I'm in this kind of in-between state. <laughs> And uh, it's probably going to take you guys a while to kind of get used to my accent a little bit. But, um, but it's funny. I go home, and, and they're like, man, you, you, your Icelandic just has this southern accent. It's, it's really weird. So it's a good thing that I actually um, I prefer drawing to talking. Um, and Le Corbusier has this great quote that I, I'm a big fan of. So... Um, I, I don't remember myself not drawing. I've, I've been drawing since I was, you know, a baby. And at the age of 17, I, I, got an, I was lucky enough to get an internship at an ad agency or a design agency in Iceland. And this was the biggest ad agency. Uh, the creative culture there was phenomenal. Everything was kind of centered around designers, and, and we were treated really well. And, you know, you know, the owner fought for ideas. So I got that into my bloodstream at a very early age, that cre creativity is really important. So at the same time I was interning there, I was going to college, and I, was, I had a cartoon at a, at a little um, uh, kids' magazine called ABC. And I, I'm no, I have no idea what I was thinking there with, with, with this, but uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> It looks cool. So this is kind of what I, I did to support myself going through school. So I remember uh, it was kind of a crossroads for me. So, you know, I've been doing this for a while, and I felt like, you know, I was getting pretty good at this. And there was a teacher in my school that he had been doing the same style of cartoons for all of his life, all of his career. And I'm like, I, I don't... I don't want to become this guy. I don't want to be the guy that just does the same thing for the rest of my life. So I was working at a concept at the design agency, and, and I, I wanted to do a photo shoot. And I'm like, I'm not going to illustrate this one. So I remember I was presenting it to the owner, and the owner says these words, and I never forget them. She said, Stefan, why don't you just stick with what you're good at? And I was like, well, th those were just fighting words. I'm, you know, and I pretty much, I, I didn't draw after that. And I'm like, 
I'm going to expand my toolbox and I'm going to, you know, just, you know, do a lot of things. You know, you know I want to be able to create anything I want. So this is me today. And I am a, a founder and partner at a company called Armchair. And we do digital design, we do branding, we do all kinds of things. And so on a day, on a day, on, a, on an average day, this is pretty much what I do. So I, I wear a lot of hats. We're a, we're a small agency. So, you know, I'm, I'm creative director, art director, graphic designer, digital designer, you know, work on concepts. You know, I, I, I have my hands in, in, in everything, probably drive everybody crazy. But, you know, at, at night and when I feel like it, I do uh, typography, kind of whenever inspiration strikes. And then after this, I'm definitely pursuing a motivational speaking career. Uh, so to me, this is kind of the, the perfect Venn diagram for, lang uh, for language, for expression. So whenever I design, I, if I get the perfect mix of these elements, then you know, we, we have a really, really tight uh, presentation. So I think uh, visual language is image, it's words, and it's form. Uh, so at the heart of that is, is something really special, something really compact. So just to give you an example of that, so when you have words on their own, you know, they speak, they're simple, but if you add an image to it, it just adds so much more. So in a very concentrated space, you have something that just speaks volumes. You know, there's a lot of, lot of stuff that is happening in this small space. So, uh, like Blake said, you know, he has been trying to do, get me to do this for a long time, and I'm like, Blake, no, I'm terrified of public speaking. I, I, I can't do this. So I decided, I, you know, I need to man up. I just need to do this, and and uh, and ironically, this is like the biggest outturn ever, the biggest crowd ever. So I'm like, oh God, how am I going to do this? But uh, so the first thing I did when when I actually said yes. Um, I decided I was just going to write a list of my principles. You know, so what is it that I think about when I, when I design? And then I can maybe kind of structure my talk around it. So I came up with about 30 um, principles. So uh, anybody have a hard stop at, let's say, what, two? No, I'm, I'm kidding. So I think what, what I'm going to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to base the talk around about seven principles, and, and, and I, I'm going to illustrate them with, with some of my work. So some match, some don't match so much, but, but these are really things that are very important to me. So let's start with uh, number one and then just make our way to number eight, uh, seven. One, think by making. Don't just think by thinking. So. Remember when we were kids, um, nothing was a big deal. I would just walk up to you and we would just play and, and you know, there were, I wouldn't even need to know your name. We would just go and we would invent things and we would get into trouble and, you know, do all kinds of stuff we probably shouldn't be doing. But somewhere along the way, we kind of lose that. And I think that, you know, at that age, you don't think about mistakes until, you know, your mom comes and points it out. But I think mistakes are really important in, in creativity. So I want to use uh, a typeface called Black Slabov as an example, which really started off as play. You know, I was just having fun. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in my uh, office and I'm, I'm, you know, thinking, you know, how, how thick and how black can I make a typeface? So I posted this on Flickr and I just started getting this really enthusiastic response, which was, which was great. But one of which was from a designer that I was actually a big fan of. And he came on there and he said, um, hey, if you expand this into a full alphabet, I'll, I will publish it. And, and um, he has a, a font foundry called You Work For Them. So I did. So I took his uh, offer and I just created this a uh, mess of a document. So, but coming from that, I, I had the full alphabet. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a, 
a little zoom into the, into the process. So, you know, nothing comes easy. So something that started off as just fun and, and you know, I was having a blast, now things are getting really hard. You know, what's, how do I get to that perfect letter? You know, it's kind of you, you have to date around a little bit to find that, that, that one, the perfect one. But the more work you do, the more, you know, you, you, you know it when you see it. This, this is the one. There's, there's no others. So that's the one that I kind of arrived at. Uh, and some of you might know this from uh, a mural that I did at Octane Coffee on the west side. And this is me and my uh, buddy Farbad, who's sitting here in front of me. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the font was, was, a, it was a huge hit, and I was seeing it everywhere. It was, it was in magazines, and people were emailing me. You know, I've seen it here and there. But there was one uh, specific uh, application that I just, I loved. There was a, a SCAD student named Colin, uh, Colin Willis. And I just saved this image. He emailed this to me, and I think they just did it in class. They cut out the, the letters. And this was just amazing to me. I don't know, Colin Willis, if you're in the crowd, or but great job. So, you know, in the words of Miles Davis, you know, it's not about what you say. It's about what you do. You know, just have fun and, and, and play. You know, don't, don't talk about it too much. Just, just kind of think about the, and, and get into the work itself. <laughs> Two. Don't be boring. So we live in this weird uh, kind of plastic universe in marketing, and you know, you know the you know the type. So I think we need to get a little weird, and you know, maybe not this weird, but we I think we need to kind of uh, shake it up a little bit. Um, I think when you when you have too many you know progressive ladies walking around and, and just kind of bland stuff in, in, in branding and, and advertising, I think you need to kind of, you know, th think a little beyond that, just, just something more original. So I want to show, we're actually finishing this uh, branding project up at Armchair, and this is for a MOCA, Museum of Contemporary Arts in Georgia. And we work with them to create a uh, branding that was really a good mix of uh, type and word. So we devised this system that has a strike through through the logo. So the strike through kind of serves as a peep show into their events and 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 uh, um, uh, and shows. So it, it's kind of subversive. It's kind of interesting. You're kind of getting a little peek into the in, into the you know without seeing the whole thing. Uh, so this would be an external application, so this is what you could see outside, which would draw you in. So we're kind of giving you a little bit of a peek. We're, you know, it, we're not showing you everything, which I think is going to invoke curiosity. Uh, and we also have a website which is about to launch probably in the next few days. And that, in the same way, it kind of works off of the same concept. So it's that strike through that has a little peek in, and then you can open it and, and, and expand to the full image. Uh, we, we made them a typeface so they can actually take their branding and apply it themselves. So this is going to have a life beyond armchair media and the client can kind of have fun with it. So, you know, your inside of Mocha GA could be the signage on the inside or, or uh, your outside of Mocha GA, which could be the, the foyer. Uh, we're really hoping they're going to... Uh, uh, have you know get this get this made so uh, Voltaire good is the enemy of great three style goes out of style so in uh, in the 1990s when I am graduating it's all about grunge and Helvetica was just a, a bad word I mean you know I would not have been caught dead using Helvetica and it, and it's it's hard to imagine now but so I jumped on the bandwagon and I did a typeface called Gore. And it sold maybe a handful of copies. Uh, you know, I, it's, you know, I, I, I was learning how to, you know, do type, type and, and I think it kind of got my hands wet. But I did see <laughs> there was a signage at a club in Iceland that was using it. And uh, I was just amazed, wow. 
I think they were like one of the two that actually bought the thing. So uh, a few months later, I see this. And it turns out that the owner had uh, collected insurance money. And, uh, but somehow that's the signage uh, survived. <laughs> I should probably see if I, can, if I can get it. So good design, it's about the essence. It's not about the style. Like, the style is going to go out of style. You don't, you don't want to deal with that. Four, learn, and then learn. So this one is about, you know, you have to learn the rules before you break them. And I'm going to use a font called Cumulus and Foam. And I did this font right after I did Black Slabbath. And Black Slabbath was kind of successful, so I was kind of terrified. How do I follow that up? Do I do, now I have to do something better? Or, and I decided, well, I'm just going to, you know, do something silly. So I came up with this font that was, you know, uh, typefaces have one criteria, and that is they have to be readable, right? And I decided I'm going to make a typeface that is just illegible. It's totally not readable. So I made three versions of the typeface, and then I want to show you an example of, you know, I mean, it kind of looks like a mess. It's organic and, and kind of all over the place, and or, you know, like, you know, almost hand drawn. But if you look closely, everything is really on a grid. Everything, this is actually a very disciplined typeface if, if, you, uh, if you think about it. So really, everything is on a grid. So you have to kind of learn the rules and break them. But you always have to break the rules. Uh, not exactly like this guy breaks the rules in his, in his outfit, but, but a great quote. This is Wim Crowell. This is one of my uh, uh, favorite designers, and he really grows on me. Five, ugly is beautiful. Ugly is beautiful. I think this that's is... That's just weird. That's just weird. This was a little text-to-voice uh, child that I found that I, I had narrate these. Um, Beauty and the Ugly, I think I, I try to stay away from doing things that are kind of the norm. I try to, you know, think ahead. You know, you, we, we don't want to kind of jump on the bandwagon and do what everybody else is doing, right? So I'm, I have kind of this thing where I'm like, well, let, let me just make it ugly. Like, and it just kind of shakes off any kind of um, programming that I, I have in my head. So I want to show there's an a experimental record label in Atlanta called Geographic North. And I did a logo for them that is very minimalist and, you know, almost has a brutalist quality to it. So it serves kind of at the center of a really beautiful design system that they have that uh, Farbot Kokapi um, is the designer behind the, the label. And they release um, records and, and cassettes and, and uh, really, really beautiful stuff. And Tom Waits is a good example of, of this ugly beauty to me. Six, design is spatial. Ew. So this is an important thing for me. I, design is not just about what you have in front of you, it's what you do with it. So if you create a logo, it's not just about the logo, it's, a, it's about how you use it, where you place it. So um, I'm going to show you a few things. Ma, we've been working with Ma for the past decade, built their brand, and we have a very simple logo for them, but we're able to kind of apply the logo onto an object. So it's not, we're not sticking the logo onto the object, but we're making it one with the object. We're bonding it with the object. So it just creates this interesting kind of um, fun little place that, that we can do. So business card, logo wraps to the back, and you can kind of tile it. Uh, and then uh, Octane took it a step further, and at the last expo, they created a cardboard version of the, of the logo and made it into a, a, a little coffee bar. And it was amazing how sturdy that thing was. It just, it was incredible. Uh, we just, oh, this is a perfect segue to Octane. So we just did our bags for Octane. You might have seen it on, on their shelves. But uh, Octane is about to sell, this, um, sell their bags to um, uh, retailers. So we really need something that can, you know, this is new. It really needs to dominate the shelves of, of, of the retailer. 
So we created bags that tile. So the loco really tiles, so the more bags you have, the more kind of af affect you have of, of the loco. And it really kind of takes over the, the shelf. And here it is in real life. This is at uh, Octane Grant Park. Uh, uh, another example of, of this uh, spatial design is armchair media's offices. So we have our two uh, core values. It's invent and enjoy. And this is the stuff that gets us kind of waking up in the morning. So this is uh, uh, called anamorphic uh, graphic. And it's also, it's kind of like a visual illusion. So when you come up to it, it breaks apart and you don't, you don't really see it. But from a one vantage point, you can actually read, read the words. So when you walk in, this is what you see. And, you know, we like, we're, we're, kind, we're very humble people, so we like to be very obnoxious like in a very humble way. So we like to, you know, put things on the inside, or, you know, you can put your pack of Marlboros into, into this. I like tea. Uh, and we also did a bag that has the logo as big as we can make it, but you know, just as long as you put it on the inside, it, it's okay. So, Marshall McLuhan, medium is the message. So this is, you know, the design is really what it applies to. It's not just the, the illustration itself. It's how the, it's used in the, in the system. This is the most- Seven, see, the silences. This is the biggest, um, most important thing for me when I design is this, the, the white space or the silences. And I think this applies to many things in life, whether it's music, design, even speaking. Like you, or, yeah, you, you have to have uh, a, a silence or, or a pause to kind of accentuate your, your words. And in arch it's, it's especially true with architecture. I think the space in between the buildings is, is what makes architecture. Uh, I want to use um, my latest typeface called cinder block. So it's called cinder block obviously because it, it, it stacks. And I was looking at two things with it, this typeface. One was the white space. So the white space creates a rhythm. So when you're looking at the, the letters, it's really not, the, not about the letters, but it's about the in-betweens. And that ex explains why the E has you know, a very, very short uh, space in, in between. So everything just kind of creates this r visual pattern in that typeface. So if you look at the, uh, a little bit of a close-up, you, know, you can really see what I mean with that. Uh, I want to show a video that a buddy of mine, uh, Jack Whitman with Sun and Sons, collaborated with me on. And this shows the other goal of the typeface, which is height. So the typeface came in, in eight heights. And I, just, I really wanted to see how, how high I could go with, with a typeface, like how tall it can go. So it turns out they can get it can they can get pretty tall. And this was a microsite that we also did with uh, you work for them, and and this video was on that microsite and and got got really good feedback. So um, <laughs> this was a uh, this made my day. This was a Saturday. I was kind of moping around the house, and I. It just almost felt like a dream. You know, is this really happening? But indeed, uh, Serena Williams, uh, cover interview at the New York Times, and this was my font that I just, you know, released. It, and it just came out of my, you know, old laptop, and now it's on, in the, on the New York Times on the cover. It was amazing. And the team there just did a fantastic job. Uh, just really incredible, really good talent at that magazine, and that just made it even better. And that's what I'm. What, that's what I love about when you create things that you can put out into the world. So you're, I, I'm almost creating language for other people to use as their own language, and that is a really rewarding feeling. And I don't know if you guys can relate to that in in, in what you do. Is you know you do something that other people can find useful. Uh, so it's kind of like a altruistic, like it, it comes back to you. There's, there's a, um, you know, there's always a continuous, you know, I see things here and there and 
It's just, you know, it's just a nice feeling. So Thelonious Monk, it's not what he's playing, it's what he's not playing. It's how he hits the keyboard, the spaces, the phrasing, that just really makes uh, the music for me. So I'm going to leave you with uh, one slide, uh, one thought. So be her. Be, just be, don't worry about what you're saying, just as long as you're doing it. And something will come out of it, and you'll eventually get it right, but... Just make mistakes. Alright, thank you all, thank you. Great, thanks Stefan, we'll do the Q&A now. So okay. uh, if you have any questions for Stefan, I have a, another mic, I'm gonna try to run to you so the video will record your question and uh, if you would just wanna call on people to uh, ask the question, okay, yeah, then, then he'll answer, so. You, sir? Test, test. You um, had a graphic designer and digital designer as a separate thing. What, what is the... Uh, when I say digital designer, designer I mean uh, interactive designer. So I design websites and web experiences. A graphic designer would be kind of more traditional <laughs> designer. So they're very similar. There's a lot of overlap, but there's, there's, a, there's a difference. Man, this place is so big. Hey, Stefan. Hey. Um, my question is about your artboard piece that you showed when you were working on um, a particular logo. And as you expanded, you showed all the different iterations. Yeah. I went to a talk last night at Switchyards with um, Aaron Draplin from Field Notes. Yeah. And he did a similar slide where he pulled back and it showed hundreds of iterations of this one particular logo. So I'm curious, when do you know when to stop? When do you know when you're done? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I know. I mean, it, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, it's funny because sometimes the first thing you do is what you end up with, but you don't know it until you do hundreds of, of other things. And then you maybe realize that, hey, what I did this first time was, was the best. But you, you really have to kind of put a lot of work into it. And then I think it's part intuition, you know, you, you kind of, and it's also maybe scientific in a way because, for example, a logo has to go through a lot of, uh, you know, kind of tests. It's almost like building a bridge. I mean, it has to have a, it has to carry a lot of weight and it's kind of an engineering thing. So you, you start seeing once you start applying it to different applications, like does it work on a pen and does it work on a, on an airplane, and, and it's just a, a kind of a testing process. And then if it passes that test, you know that you have it. But then, you know, do you like it? Is it cool? Is it something that is furthering you as a designer? Is it something that is good for the client? So it's just a, a, a combination of a lot of factors that go into designing what that perfect logo is. Let's do two more questions. Okay, I have, uh, there's somebody down there. Uh, he's gonna bring you a microphone. Uh, my name is Janine. My question is, when you started the agency, it's like a three-parter. Yeah. Why did you start it? How did you get your first clients? And then what was your biggest challenge in selling your creative solutions to the clients that you got? Oh, those are big questions. Uh, so we, uh, started Armchair, and we were the kind of the core team that had been at CNN.com. So m I have three other partners, and they all, one of them kind of started CNN.com, came, like came up with the idea. So there was a big shakeup at CNN.com, and we pretty much got laid off. So 
we used our severance to start Armchair. So we all had you know, good severance packages and we kind of took advantage of that. So that's how we, we got up and running with the, with the agency. So the second question, can you say that again? Your first clients? Yeah. Uh, first client, so basically what happens when you start an agency, you sit around and you're like, we're ready to go. You know, <laughs> we, we have an agency, everybody, the whole world should know this, right? And then we just stare at the phone and the phone is not going to ring. So you, you realize you're going to have to go out and, and find a, a client. I think our first client was uh, a lady that created dog tags. And I just remember we had to create a website that it had to look like dog tags, like the navigation was all metallic, dog taggy, and, and uh, you know, it, we got a few bucks for it. But you know, you really have to start at the bottom. Starting a company is like anything else. It's like freelancing. You, you have to work your way up. And the other question was, uh, how selling to a client? Our biggest challenge, challenge selling a creative solution to a client. I think uh, that's probably half of the of, of designing is being able to relate with a client and being able to have the client understand what you're trying to do. There's nothing worse than showing up and having a big, big presentation and there's just like, you know, dead eyes and, and, uh, and the thing gets shot down and, and you're just like, oh my God, I wasted all this time on it. I think what we've been doing lately is we have a very iterative process with the client. We, we invite them into the process. We get them comfortable with kind of the creative mess. Um, so there's no, there's no surprises. Like they, we almost go through the, you know, the emotions with us as, as we get to that final point. So they get to see how the kind of the sausage is, is made, but I think it's very effective because they feel ownership over the project, over, over the loco or the, or the uh, um, you know, uh, what, whatever we're delivering to them. And they feel like they've been a part of it and, and you know, it's not something that they're being sold to. So I think, I think that close kind of relationship through the process has been working for us really well lately. Let's do one more. One more. Creative mornings, everyone. Um, my question speaks directly to your creative process. Yeah. So with you sp using um, language as your medium, I know I often come into problems of trying to translate a human experience and language often fails me in those moments. What are ways that you work through that or, or are, are kind of able to have a feeling or have an emotion, try to, try to have an experience and then find the language to actually adequately you know, translate that? Oh. That's a, that's, a, that's a tough question. Is that question. heavy? Well, um, <laughs> I think we all have, I, I went to a talk and, and the speaker, um, Jessica Tillier, um, she is a, a creative director at Stone Yamashita Partners and she was talking about our, our, our inner sup superpower. I think everybody has something that they do really well and we all exercise it, right? I mean, you're a writer, you, you, know, you sit and you write a journal, you write poetry, or you're an artist, you draw, or you know, you, you're a musician, you practice on the piano. And I think that is kind of the source of expression, is, is you kind of use your talent and you connect with, with some outside experience and you bring that into your process. That's really how I, you know, I'm constantly I'm constantly, constantly drawing and kind of practicing and, and then I see something that, in, that sparks an idea and then all of a sudden, you know, I kind of have this muscle, like create a muscle that I can really kind of jump in and, 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 you know, I'm ready to go once I see the opportunity. Did that answer your question? No, I wasn't most sure. definitely. You're okay. saying it, beyond thinking, do because... Well, yes. I mean, it, it's, you, you have your left and, and right side of your brain. I mean, you have to come up on stage and talk about things sometimes, but what really interests me more than that is, is just seeing things. Like, you know, I'm not interested in Andy Warhol talking about his, his shit. I mean, I just want to see it. I, and I, I, can, I, I hear what he's saying through, through his paintings. Thank you. you. Know, or music. You know, same, same with music. Awesome. Let's give Stefan another round of applause. Right. Thank you, guys.